um, to, to please slow down. So we'll all take a breath and, and, uh, and uh, uh, move a little bit more slowly. We have some Good. today, but thank you, Melissa, um, for that comment. Melissa, thank you. Yeah, and um, I will. This will be uh, a very familiar kind of pattern as Southern and I go back and forth. I'm an accelerator. She's the break. Uh, together, we'll make sure that this becomes a conversation that all of us can have. And part of my speed is because I'm from New York, and also because we started late. So I'll try to pace, but there's a lot to get to. So uh, here is a, a, a summary of the urgent health priorities, health equity priorities for the moment. Uh, we know that for minority communities, low-income, vulnerable communities, um, that uh, specifically Black, Latinx, immigrant, and low-income com communities, uh, that there are urgent priorities right now to first expand testing and contact tracing, uh, especially in those communities, to support psychological uh, services, social supports, and primary health care uh, needs that, that are certainly continuing. People with diabetes and depression still have those conditions, and we need to figure out how to get services to them. Uh, and lastly, that we need to strengthen the infrastructure and the services of community-based organizations. And so a statewide strategy that, uh, that at least a frame that we're using, and we invite everybody today to start to kind of uh, whittle against this and make it better, um, is a, prior, a statewide strategy that can help build on these health equity priorities and try to uh, bolster a community-based workforce, and that's a specific term, uh, to enhance uh, the expansion of testing, well, let's use enhanced contact tracing. We'll explain what that means on this call to uh, bolster the need in the community to not only expand contact tracing, but also support primary health, psychological and social uh, needs. Uh, we need an expansion uh, and a, a rapid deployment of community health workers and promotoras. And then of course, to uh, support community infrastructure, we need essential nonprofits. These are the three components of what we're calling a community-based workforce strategy. And lest people get confused, um, as we now turn over to our um, lightning, lightning round of questions to our presenters today, uh, I want to make sure that we uh, are clear in terms of what we mean by community-based workforce. We know that um, many states are uh, scaling healthcare workforces. We know, as you can see on the left here, there's a variety of uh, regulations, um, initiatives, uh, and other things that have been put in place right now to expand, uh, to surge the capacity of the healthcare workforce to treat the sick in our hospitals and our clinics. These are absolutely necessary. Many states are doing these. We also know that governmental public health uh, is in need of further support, not only because they've come from a chronically under-resourced uh, baseline, uh, but because we, now more than ever, we need to surge past that baseline to, to protect the, the health of communities and to decrease transmission of COVID-19. Uh, that's essential not only from a public health perspective, for, but obviously from an economic one. And so there's a variety of initiatives here and calls for even more investments, as you can see here in the bottom right. From a governmental public health perspective and from a formal kind of medical professional perspective, what else can be done? Uh, and what we're proposing here as a way to help think through this more clearly as states consider their, their opportunities here is that across all states with federal support, we can um, provide a community-based workforce. And what is a community-based workforce? A community-based workforce has been recognized from the get-go as part of an essential, um, uh, essential component of a response to all disasters. Um, by community-based workforce, we mean community-based organizations, nonprofits, community health workers and promotoras, and trained volunteers that are organized. Uh, it's not just international bodies that have recognized this, but it's also the CDC and um, others, including recently, um, and a wonderful report recently, um, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers, ASTO. So we, we know that there are key functions they can perform, and uh, we know this is a, a key part of what can happen. So uh, before we kind of move forward here uh, to talk through what, um, to turn it over, there have been a variety of conversations that are happening across the space, and hopefully this is a chance to unpack some of these ideas and align them, uh, the ideas of what a community-based workforce strategy can look like. And largely speaking, uh, they seem to be amassing around these three buckets of enhanced contact tracing, community health workers, and supporting essential nonprofits. For today, we want to focus in particular on the, the strategies around community health workers and promotoras and what can be done there. And so uh, we'll certainly touch upon all these, and these are not silo uh, approaches. These are interwoven um, uh, strategies, but we want to make an emphasis given the expertise we have in line of what can be done from a national and, and state perspective around community health workers. So that's my attempt to uh, set the table. I will, um, I'll stop my screen share and, and let us now going to turn to the more important um, conversation right now, which is uh, the speakers that we have. So let me go through a first a lightning round of questions, 
and ask um, uh, th this question to our discussants today. Why are community health workers so vital in this moment? And what specific um, roles uh, can community health workers play in this moment from a public health perspective, from an economic perspective? Uh, so why are they vital and what specific roles can they play? And we'll go through a round robin and do maybe two minutes each. And as you get the baton, pass it to the next person. So let's start, um, let's start with uh, Raj and Claire, uh, particularly to give us a quick global context. And we'll turn it over to Shreya and Denise and go from there. So Raj, uh, thank you so much. Raj. Thanks, Rishi. And uh, wow, what an incredible, almost 400 people. It's just exciting to be amongst this community. Claire, do you want to go first or you want me to? Please go ahead, Raj. I'll jump in a okay. second. Well, let me say, you know, I, I, um, I feel like there's probably no better moment than now for this movement of people across this country, but also around the world. Uh, to really uh, focus on, on, on health equity, on the epidemic, on the social needs of patients. So I just want to thank um, the Health Begins team and um, all the speakers that are going to speak after me. There's so much wisdom here. So in terms of why community health workers are important, I mean, my first orientation to this actually comes from the state of Alaska. Uh, about 20 years ago, I worked there um, uh, uh, where they've, they've uh, put forward an incredible, I think many of you will know it or have worked in it, a community health aid program with community health workers from Alaska Native communities who um, have been hired and trained in uh, over the last 50, 60 years to address uh, healthcare needs and social needs on the tundra in, um, uh, in, in, in Alaska. Um, I, I've also, with my colleagues, including Leisha McCormick, who's on the line now, our president, uh, at Last Mile Health, have had the privilege of working on these issues in places like Liberia, Malawi, Ethiopia, and elsewhere, but you know, I think what I what we've learned from our partners across there, and also um, through some online courses we've developed, um, uh, and and I think some of you have joined. Um, we we posted this on that course. We have about forty thousand folks enrolled around the world on a course called Strengthening Community Health Worker Programs. About twenty five percent of them are here in the United States. I mean, what we've learned from that collective experience is that number one, community health workers. Uh, deeply matter for addressing acute epidemics. Um, those, that is on the, on the common fundamental uh, efforts of preventing, detecting, and responding to epidemics. Um, actually on the course, uh, we, we found looking back in the history of some of the most important programs, whether it was smallpox vaccines in China, tuberculosis control in Alaska, Ebola, uh, uh, Ebola response in Liberia, almost every one of the strong community health worker programs that address primary care, social needs, and epidemic uh, response started in response to some uh, important epidemic or pandemic. Um, so I think that's one reason we know community health workers are important. They're valuable for prevention, detection, and response. Um, they're valuable now in this crisis. The second, of course, is uh, some of the points you've raised. The, the social needs um, of, of vulnerable communities has increased. And while so much is being made of COVID, the COVID pandemic as the, quote, great equalizer, I think many of us know that's just simply not true. Uh, as in other in, in, uh, epidemics, risk is not distributed equally. Um, the, the, the parts of Massachusetts, for instance, uh, that have the highest uh, epicenter are, are communities like Chelsea, where I worked as a resident, and, and uh, you know, a, a large majority of the community there um, is, is immigrant, and they are also um, largely essential service workers and at greater risk than I am as a physician who is largely um, situated at home uh, trying to lead a public health response. So I think, I think we, we know that to address the social needs of those communities, we need to be able to bring those communities into, uh, 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 in, into, into the response. So I think to me, those are two reasons, Rishi, and I'm gonna turn over to, yeah. to Claire. Um, to, yeah. uh, but we've seen that pattern elsewhere in Liberia and Africa and Asia. Um, and I think we're seeing it here again in the United yeah. States, over to you. Yeah, absolutely, Raj. I think it's well said that there's the health needs, absolutely. We know CHWs are essential for addressing pandemic. We also know as CHWs are essential for addressing the, the social needs of these vulnerable populations and, and doing, as you said, addressing these, the fact that risk is not distributed equally. The third reason I'd add to that, Raj, is we know that CHWs and as contact tracers or as CHWs themselves are essentially as, as, a, as a fire break 
um, preventing this pandemic from, from flaring up again, a second surge of COVID coming next winter, um, by, by making these communities, these vulnerable marginalized communities, healthier now and healthier in the future. And, and therefore, CHWs are critical for reopening these economies as contact tracers. And we've seen governor after governor say, I can't reopen until I have better testing and better contact tracing. I need an army of community health workers, essentially. We need to work on the branding and the interplay. And, and Shreya will speak to this a little bit between CHWs and contact tracers but also for then preventing the next resurgence of, of pandemic, whether it's coronavirus or something, something else. Um, and, and if we don't do that on the economic side of, of enabling these economies to reopen, we'll see the health and the social needs just exacerbated. Um, and I think it's absolutely critical. Last point I would make is that as we think about the next steps here to, to absolutely follow the money that's becoming available that Rishi pointed to, but also think very clearly about how we're building for the future and how we're we building sustainable community health worker programs that are tapped into all the sustainable sources of funding that are out there. So I'll pause there and please turn it back to Rishi and the team. Raj, Claire, thank you so much. This lightning round so far is off to a great start. Shreya, Denise, and then we'll go to Emily and Alex. So Shreya, please. Uh, I'd actually love to hear from Denise first, who is an actual community health worker. So it always feels unusual to wonderful. Hear wonderful. Front lines. Hi, good afternoon, Great. everyone. My name is Denise Octavia Smith, and I am a CHW um, and a, a patient navigator, and I'm the founding executive director of the National Association of Community Health Workers. Um, Nachwa is unifying CHWs nationally to support communities uh, in achieving health equity and social justice. Um, our membership uh, is working right now in 46 states as frontline public health workers uh, with a, a shared language and cultural communication experience, um, which is developed into relationship that helps us to establish trust, respect, uh, and to liaison between health and social services and community services. We are uh, bridge builders. We are also capacity builders and advocates. Um, I really appreciate, uh, Rishi, you taking time to lift up Black and Latinx communities. Uh, I also want to take a moment and lift up our indigenous tribal nations of there are over 537 and also our Asian American, our native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander or Asian presenting community members who are experiencing not only increased and disproportionate rates of infection and death, but also stigma and violence right now in this time. Uh, CHWs come from all of these communities and experiences, and they draw from uh, the cultural respect and language and origin to develop a highly focused and targeted and culturally appropriate services. So there are three things that, uh, that, that I wanna lift up today on behalf of this highly diverse workforce that is operating right now across our country, across sector, across culture and experience. Number one, I would like for all public and private institutions and organizations to recognize and or classify community health workers as an essential critical infrastructure workforce during this time of COVID-19 emergency response. And I hope we have an opportunity to talk more about that. But the US Department of Homeland Security has issued that guidance to states. And some, of, some states have adopted that language and we can talk about the, the power of that language and what it might do. There are currently over 120,000 CHWs who are employed across our country. There are many more who are working as lay CHWs volunteering or who were not captured in that data. And so we have a robust, experienced, skilled, trained, ready workforce. Uh, the second is I really want to elevate this opportunity for 
public and private institutions to fund and partner with state CHW associations and networks. Nachwa, we recognize these organizations who are operating right now in more than 30 states as organized 501c3s or informal networks of CHWs working across sector who are gonna be critical in this time to hire and train contact tracers, to develop workforce planning and evaluation, uh, to lead community coordination and kind of resource navigation. So I hope we can talk more about that. And then the third item is really for all other uh, workforces and communities and institutions to recognize community health workers, not only as downstream implementers of service and service delivery, but as meaningful contributors and leaders to transform systems. And we'll have a chance to talk about the fact that some of the innovation that's going to come out of this emergency response can really transform and drive health equity so that we can change historic racism and structures that have not worked for community health and well-being. So I'm excited to talk more about these items and, and thank you, of course, uh, for Health Begins, Rishi, Sadina, and uh, everyone on the call. Denise, I don't have to say it. Uh, you just have to look in the chat to see how many um, amens and 100% um, and et cetera. So just take a look at that. And um, I don't think you'd be surprised by a lot of the, the, um, the folks on the line who um, resonated with everything you just said. So thank you. Shreya, um, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, why CHWs now? Uh, what, what are the important roles as well? Please. Yeah, I, I, I think um, a lot of you have said it. Um, people aren't just dying of COVID. They haven't just been dying of one disease, they die of the underlying social um, injustice. Um, and so we need a workforce from within the community who can address COVID, but can also address all of the root cause issues that amplify it. Um, you know, we have, um, and you know, Rishi, thank you for setting up such a great kind of conceptual model. You kind of raise these three different buckets of, you know, healthcare workforce, a public health workforce, I think all of those should be gravitated towards a community-based workforce. And when um, ever possible, healthcare roles, public health roles should be performed by community members who have lived expertise um, and who you know, can build capacity. Um, and so you know, we have evidence. Uh, you know, a lot of what my team and I have done over the past decade is to uh, both develop using formative science. You know, we started out uh, interviewing 1,500 people, patients, uh, individuals on porches and shelters and bedsides and asked them what they needed uh, in order to make themselves healthier and their communities healthier. We took all of these lessons from folks like Raj and the global health experience, and we kind of translated that into a packaged up impact model, you know, tested in clinical trials. So there's a, a strong, and you know, we're not the only ones, there's so many public health scientists and community organizers and community scientists across the country who have developed a strong evidence base. There's an ROI, we have scalable tools. Many of you um, know that we're kind of starting to think about developing national standards. So really the only question is why wouldn't you have this workforce right now? And I think that's an important question to ask, right? Because it's been pissing me off that we're not in that conversation nationally and that if you read the news it's about you know volunteer grad students and you know icu docs and no offense to any of those types of people who are on the call but i think there's some structural racism or classism that is making us overlook the elephant in the room um, which is what denise has been you know talking about it, this is the solution i mean who else could um, you know, attack not only COVID, but drop off food on porches, get to know who people are and you know, just be a listening ear, um, organize virtual dance parties, battle eviction notices. This is one person who can do all of these things and yet we're not having that conversation. That's, some, that's nonsense. So um, I think that is kind of my point number one is why aren't we doing this and let's ask those questions. Um, point two about how to actually operationalize and break up what I think are uh, different needs, um, i.e. community health workers and, you know, contact tracers. I really like how you set it up, Rishi. I think that the base of this should be a long-term 
evidence-based, sustainable, robust community health worker workforce. Um, and I think that they actually um, should be built for long-term sustainability. And you can add contact tracing as one of their roles, but you don't have the tail wag the dog. You know, it would be like talking about uh, let's, uh, you know, create a frontline doctor workforce, but then just call them blood pressure checkers, you know, like community health workers do a lot of things. So I think what I would recommend is a population health approach where we at any given community stratify, you know, who is high risk versus who's just kind of chilling. And then the people who are high risk should have everything done by a community health worker, including, yeah, contact tracing. To me, that's an add-on. It's critical, but it's an add-on. And then for those who are really low risk, you can have the surge workforce who can sort of pop up and, you know, do just technology-based contact tracing for, you know, wealthy suburbanites um, and just be done with it. And that workforce can sort of pop up but we cannot set this conversation up for community health workers to pop up. Like that will be a huge missed opportunity. So I don't want us to say first contact tracing and then let's hopefully build it into a community health. No, it has to be the same time and community health workers have to be the base providing these services for those who need them. The third real quick piece I'll say is that there's two um, parallel conversations and funding streams and we need to find a way to connect them. There is a state-based conversation that you framed, Rishi, but there's also a federal and a, a federal funding stream. So what, um, uh, just to lay that landscape, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, do not currently reimburse community health workers for most of their services, or if they do so, they're just in these um, narrow demonstration projects or narrow waivers. We've put out a letter, which hopefully all of you guys can sign, um, recommending that CMS use this opportunity moment to begin reimbursing community health workers more broadly. I think that is a long-term source of funding that is going to be baked in mm -hmm. healthcare and public health um, for supporting this workforce. Parallel to that, there are these state-based, you know, efforts and financing streams, which are more, you know, time sensitive. And the way that's been operationalized is states, uh, uh, NGA, ASTO, really crying out and needing fast money from stimulus package dollars um, to kind of mobilize a workforce quickly. But I think if we can talk today about how to connect these threads and make sure that we can get long-term financing in addition to short-term relief and make sure some of those dollars flow across, that would be really terrific. Sure, thank you so much. And I think what you and, and, and Denise also in particular kind of elevated and we'll, our, our actions that we can take and we'll come to those uh, in the, the, the next round quickly, I want to make sure we get in to build on this wonderful lightning round here. Let's get um, Emily, if you can share your perspective on the, the, both what you're doing, but more importantly, the, um, what you see as the kind of the case right now for CHWs in this broader context. And then we'll end with Alex as well to kind of uh, bring us home for this particular round before we pivot soon to now concrete actions at the federal and state level. Emily, please. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Rishi. I'm I'm Emily Rowe. I'm from Partners in Health, and I'm working on the um, the contact tracing project with the state of Massachusetts right now. And I'm so tempted just to say ditto to what they all said because I wholeheartedly agree. Um, so just a few kind of practical things from our experience here. I'll note that my background is working in um, rural Malawi for the last several years with community health workers, and people keep asking me why is this different. Like what's different about um, working in Massachusetts and working in rural Malawi in this particular project? The answer is not very much, to be honest. The challenges are very similar, right? The the point of the whole thing is very similar, um, and so I think the 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 stuff I'll say about kind of the why is we know that the battleground for COVID nineteen is community transmission. This is something we know, and. We, we also know that contact tracing is kind of a, a cornerstone of that. So I'll echo fellow panelists that this is a huge kind of opportunity and window into a broader advocacy um, initiative for kind of um, expanding community health worker workforce in the, in the future. Um, we are using our um, contact tracing program to take a community health worker workforce across Massachusetts with the basic principle of reaching everybody, every case and every contact. And I think one role in there for the people part is, um, I'll just kind of preempt uh, the question we often get, which is why not just let tech do that? Like we've all seen all the tech in all the news. Um, and I think the basic thing is there, we probably need tech 
in this and it'll make it efficient and better and faster and especially working remotely, but there's no way that tech could do this itself. And if we thought that was going to be the case, maybe, you know, it should have happened already in some, in some disease somewhere, but it never has only been tech. So I think using a human workforce to reach every case and every contact is really the the program we're, we're trying to do to try to reduce community transmission. And the equity piece comes in hugely because there's really no point in contact tracing if we're not going to support, support people to safely isolate and quarantine. And if that's like th this crazy scenario where, it, where we're in, where the social contract here is to actually be separated and far apart, right? It's totally counterintuitive and it's really difficult. And so there is the contact tracing lesson here in addition to totally agreeing with that community health worker roles cannot be like parsed out into one vertical thing is it's totally pointless to do contact tracing if it's not connected into safe safely supporting people to isolate and quarantine and that is where vulnerability and equity come in and the need to facilitate connection to resources and make sure people have food and diapers and can pay their water bill and whatever it, it might be and, and or connection to community facilities if that's if that's something to to be needed. So I think that um, the community health workers are kind of the action arm of if, if the social contract here is for all patients and contacts to socially isolate or quarantine, then the other side of that is that we have to take care of people. And, and this is a very mm. clear way to do that and what we've used kind of um, all over the world in many ways. So um, I'll stop there, but thank you. Emily, thank you so much. Um, the, um, let me turn it over to Alex right now. Alex, um, uh, there's a lot that's been said and I imagine you're gonna wanna um, ditto as well, but I, I know you also have a unique perspective, especially with health leads as engagement in this space. So please. Yeah, thanks Rishi. And it's, um, it's such a pleasure to be on this panel too. I just really appreciate everybody around the virtual table and. Um, Rishi showed a slide that uh, Health Leads we've been talking about a lot, which is this idea of a second demand for social resources or essential resources. And I want to set the table for the longevity of the fight we're in right now. So while our medical brothers and sisters are focused on COVID, um, we're seeing jobless rates, we're seeing shelter in place exacerbate abuse and neglect and food insecurity and seeing our, the, the health inequities on warp speed. So the health of, as Denise talked about, black and brown and indigenous brothers and sisters are now even more in danger because the systems have gravely failed many of us in this, um, in this fight. And so if you think about the second curve that we are, you know, think about 2008, it took two years to bounce back from an economy standpoint. It's taken 10 years for jobs to bounce back which means in this economic downturn globally, we're seeing probably rates of, of joblessness like the Great Depression. Um, the St. Louis Fed has predicted around 32% of unemployment, which means the need for social resources and essential resources are not only spiking right now because of sheltering in place, but are gonna stay there. At the same time, we're seeing CBOs start to close or have to shutter um, or shut down hours. And the other thing we're seeing is that many of us around this virtual table have spent years enabling and working with the healthcare system to start to address essential resources. And right now, while healthcare is not um, doing specialty or subspecialty work, they're losing a lot of money. And so they're not gonna be able to, to jump in to addressing essential resources in the same ways. And so they're just similar to the COVID curve, there need to be multiple interventions for the second curve. And one of the biggest parts, if we're really serious about health equity right now, I've long been worried that it's a buzzword that we're all jumping on a train. Like, what's that actually mean? Like, let's break down what that means. A lot of that is about how do you listen to what community needs? How do you listen to what black and brown people need for their health? And that's where community health workers fit in. Community health workers, if funded and supported and thought of as a long-term um, part of the team that's working on social needs, not only funded here and there by private and public funding, but actually part of how we think about a larger care team, that's what's gonna enable longevity for community health workers. And that's what many of the people around the table have been working on. 
So for us, we're also thinking about how do we use this moment in time, this wreckage that's happening because of COVID. There's also this bright side of there's so much innovation. We're in a moment in time where we're seeing people come around a table like this one and start to think about, okay, so how do we work together? How do we think about the funding? How do we think about the training? How do we think about putting, you know, having the decision makers actually be from the community? We have to move on this window because even six months from now, we may not have the same opportunity. So can we actually think about what's the de-siloing not only within health, but also how do we de-silo with our ed education partners? Right now, there's a lot of work going on about how do you think about what kids are gonna need who are falling behind and seeing great educational disparities. Community health workers have a role in that too. So how do we think about community health workers not only as an answer for COVID in the next six months, but what about the next 20 years? What about the rest of our lives? And what about not only for health, but also for education, for justice? Um, so for, for us, I think the biggest call to action is let's get in this as not only the marathon right now, but what are the policy and practice we need to put in place for the long term, for the rest of our lifetime? So we don't actually have to revisit the why. We don't actually have to ask why not. We can actually say this is part of our community. This is part of how we address health everywhere. Alex, thank you. And I'll just say, um, as echoing com comments here, um, this is an amazing group, an amazing set of presentations right now. And I think when we set the table, we've now made the case better than perhaps has been made in a long time with uh, this group at least amassed right now. So for those listening in, I think it's clear that the case has been made for why CHWs play a vital role. Let's um, mark time, it's 1045 right now. Let's switch from making the case to concrete actions right now, state and or federal kind of actions. Um, and I'm gonna ask uh, to lead us off, um, uh, I'm gonna do two things. Um, one, uh, to be able to kind of make this action oriented here, let me go ahead and share my screen here and show you guys a working slide uh, based on conversations that I've had with, um, with each of you in the past and then ask um, for uh, folks to kind of give voice to this to, to essentially think about what we can do um, in this case and I'm, I'm happy to amend it as well if I've gotten everything anything wrong and meantime while I we, we turn to our uh, speakers right now to voice over some of these strategies uh, at a state and or federal level um, we also invite you uh, uh, who everybody who's joined us today please go ahead and chime in with your suggestions or ideas for concrete action strategies right now not just suggestions or what it could have should have I, I wish we could have a I think these are, this is a time for concrete advocacy and organizing uh, in the truest spirit of what community health workers and promotoras do. So with that, um, let me turn first to Shreya uh, to voice over what um, you met, or alluded to earlier, which is um, the calling for um, states to use Medicaid state plan amendments. Can you give voice to that briefly? And then we'll, we'll um, open the floor next to Denise yeah. and we'll go from there. Yeah, sure. Thanks Please. For um, so we have two concrete strategies uh, right now that we're putting out. Um, and the way that we developed them was that we hosted, um, as, as many of you know, because you've joined us, these national conversations over the last three weeks. And we basically asked folks for input and we took a lot of that input and we drafted it into a letter to CMS and we're working on another letter to Congress. So if you have any other ideas you know, for, for any of this, let us know. Um, the, the, these are meant to be a starting point you know, to get something concrete um, to policymakers because of the, t the policy window is incredibly short. We've been in touch with a lot of these high level policymakers and decisions are being made quickly. Um, so that's why we, we moved very quickly. So letter one to CMS encourages CMS, the, you know, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services to basically tell states to include, submit SPAs, waivers, or other mechanisms to reimburse community health workers more broadly for their services. The reason that you know, we felt that this was strategic and we got a lot of advice from you know, folks within CMS, policy experts, et cetera, is that CMS already has a, spa, a, 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 a regulation that speaks to the fact that states can submit SPAs to uh, reimburse community health workers for their services, but it's really, really narrow right now. It's just for this like very narrow definition of preventive services. So only four states since 2014 have submitted them. So we basically just said, blow that open a little bit. It's not that heavy of a lift. So they seem like they're inclined to maybe do this if we can get another, enough support behind it. Um, so, so that's really ask one. Ask two is, can CMS consider that 
um, reimbursement for community health worker services as part of COVID resiliency? And if so, it would actually get an enhanced federal match. So if I'm a state and I'm thinking, boy, should I submit this spa, you know, to have community health workers reimburse for their services? All of a sudden I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely going to do that because I'm going to get a federal match. So those are the two pieces that are in the letter to CMS. And, you know, especially point one feels really actionable. Um, Great. Approach that we're thinking for Congress real quick is that um, right, uh, Congress could do two things. One um, is to create an optional benefit for community health workers and make it a part of Medicaid so that it's kind of part of the uh, woodwork. And I'm not going to get into all of the policy details, but it really kind of makes it a lot easier for states to get these and these waivers and to get community health workers reimbursed. The other piece is I think that we would want to ask Congress for some dollars out of package for you know, the, the, the CARES 2 Act that is coming um, that can be really dedicated for this workforce. Um, so we're trying to kind of cover all of our bases, you know, some low hanging fruit that CMS can do without legislative action or dollars just to kind of flip open what they consider reimbursable by community health workers. Um, we're asking for federal dollars and matching, and then we're asking Congress to try to sort of lower the bar. Thank you, Tria. Thank you so much. Um, Denise, uh, I, I know that uh, the National Association of CHWs has been having some policy work group discussions as well, and just building on what Tria mentioned is uh, other specific actions, and e even those not included over here, and I'm, I'm happy to describe those for you. Thank you, and I'm showing my age because it's difficult for me to read that slide. <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. Well, no, that's let quite me, uh, Let me just, yeah. um, let me continue to build on all of the, uh, the insights. And if you all hear noise in the background, my husband is rebuilding our roof at the moment. <laughs> uh, the first thing that I want to say that's really important is that CHWs, as, as NACHWA uh, works with our partners and allies to really lift up this workforce, it's important to say that CHWs are not anybody. When we talk about hiring for contact tracing, care coordination, uh, scaling up uh, the public health infrastructure, it is not that we will just hire anyone and then call them community health workers. Community health workers have origins in their compassion, in their qualities, in their approaches that uh, that reach back for generations. So I want to make that point and perhaps we can talk about that later. CHWs have to be recognized as essential critical infrastructure workers. That was one of the points that I mm -hmm. made earlier. So mm -hmm. that they can get the personal protective equipment that they need to actually reach people who are right now experiencing vulnerability. It is fantastic to say we now have 10,000 testing sites and you can drive up and access those sites. But for people without cars, this is not effective. It is fine for people to take an Uber or a Lyft or to take the bus to a testing site. But if you do not have a phone, no one can reach you for the results days later. So we need this critical infrastructure workforce to bridge the digital divide, the technical divide, the transportation divide, the literacy divide, the citizenship divide. There are people who are afraid to get tested because of their citizenship status. So. I'm, I'm elevating the workforce in this way so that we recognize this really is a group of skilled, trained, compassionate people who sign mm -hmm. for this work, who have a deep commitment. Mm -hmm. I want to make a quick point about funding because I, I think this is really important. Please. As Nachwa, as we consider our membership, the majority of our members in 46 states are not connected to organizations that can receive Medicaid funding. So we want folks to remember when we are considering standing up a workforce that number one, to, to get those dollars to reach CHWs wherever they are, we have to go beyond and find really innovative solutions and funding packages. 
That's the first thing. Uh, that funding also, when it reaches community, there to strengthen the rebuild and the recovery. When you invest in CHW networks and ask them to hire CHWs to train contact tracers and care coordinators, you're not just investing in the CHWs and those services, you're actually investing in the community. You're bringing those dollars to the community. So I think that's really Thank important. You. And the last Thank is you. to remember that CHWs are there to help transform these systems. As many people mentioned, and as I'll say it again, there are things that are happening right now that should have happened a long time ago. And, uh, and because there was not enough momentum or motivation, certain innovations did not take place. But now that we are moving and hundreds of billions of dollars are being called down to states in various funding packages and forms, let this be the opportunity to center equity. And when you have CHWs at the table as partners in emergency response, part of the team mm -hmm. developing the plan and implementing the plan, you will bring diverse voices and perspectives to center equity in this time. Denise, thank you. I'm gonna, um, I really appreciate this in the interest of time here. Let me I'm so sorry, but I, I just have, to, I love you, Denise. Yes. 30, 30 um, seconds, but Denise, uh, Sherry, just 30 okay. seconds. I wanna get to two other people really quick before we end. Please go ahead. Denise, underscore, underscore, cosine the point that you made about not everybody is a CHW. So the operational outgrowth of that is that we do need to rethink a little bit, train and certify. Uh, you know, it's a big door to open with three minutes left in this uh, session, but right. I just want to say, right. uh, we have to hire the right people. You can't just, you know, hire a grad student or a nurse or, you know, someone who doesn't have empathy or whatever, and then call them a CHW. So, you know, I think we're thinking more holistically about, you know, not only the standards for uh, how CHWs are trained, but rather the systems in which they work, how they are hired, you know, making sure that they are safe in, the, in their work, that they have manageable right. and supervision, all of those things. Shreya, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, uh, to see if uh, this is possible, and I, I apologize in advance for asking. Um, Alex, 30 seconds on the National Service Corps expansion efforts like AmeriCorps. You, you've put that on our radar, and I'm wondering if you could speak to how um, really thoughts, my, um, parting thoughts for how those could be leveraged potentially to help fund uh, long-term community health worker growth. Yeah, so there's a other effort going on on the education side about refunding AmeriCorps, and I think Rishi has, and I think Denise and others have talked about like, what's the full-time workforce that's needed like CHWs in community to address health? And then what's the more, you know, gig workforce that's in schools and other places? And so I think this is a time to, in thinking about how do all of us work with those trying to refund AmeriCorps to understand how does either AmeriCorps work well with CHWs or is there funding for both? And so I think there needs to be, instead of doing advocacy in silos, which I think we're seeing quite a bit right now, how do we do more of what we're doing around the table and say, it's great to have someone from AmeriCorps doing, doing tutoring for middle school kids, but you should also be asking about food, housing, are they safe at home? And that to me is when a CHW comes in or at least some kind of play between the two. So I think that the ask Thank is you. for each one of us who may be in other advocacy groups, how do we start thinking about this holistically in the eyes of actually folks who are, who are receiving care and support? That was awesome. Um, and I, I think it, it speaks to, and it's uh, buried here on the busy slide here, but one of the advocacy opportunities, as he said, is to leverage these national service for expansion efforts, not to uh, view uh, CHWs as service uh, jobs, short-term service jobs, but really as uh, the roles of CHWs and helping to maybe be uh, folks to receive the warm handoffs from those uh, members of service corps members. Uh, Emily, to your, to your point, one of the things that I know that, as you highlighted in, in the work in Massachusetts that Partners in Health is doing, is uh, elevating the role of community health workers as resource coordinators, I believe. Those who are not just the kind of the entry-level service corps members, but uh, as part of the contact tracing, but those who can then take the baton. Um, what's the role of, of uh, the CSWs and promotors as resource coordinators, but also as trainers and as, as uh, in, in, you know, those on the governance kind of bodies of these emerging contact tracing initiatives? Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, no, thanks. I totally agree with all the, the points everybody has made. We've had the 
significant challenge of hiring um, a thousand people <laughs> in about six days that I'd, I'd classify at, and I, I would call them um, a big cadre of, of CHWs along the lines of incredibly dedicated people to their communities. And I think um, points are well taken about, um, you know, focusing on training and empathy and all the qualities that, that we know that they need to have. Um, and so the different roles, some of them are really focused on the contact tracing right now. Um, and then a lot of them are doing, what, they're called resource coordinators, but effectively connecting people who are um, affected by COVID, whether they're contacts or cases, um, really in any way with different local resources. So these, these people are working in collaboration with local boards of health, local nonprofits, um, other kind of public sector resources, um, and really our boots on the ground, thinking about how to connect people to uh, resources around food. We're, you know, we're identifying domestic violence and making sure people are connected and supported through that. So there's kind of, you know, 18 to 20 different kind of like pathways that we're making sure that we can mm -hmm. address vulnerability as we uncover it. So thanks for the, thanks for the question. And yeah. all of those folks are from the communities where they're working. So we kind of went town by town across the state for that. Thanks, Emily. For those who haven't seen it, uh, PIH and working with uh, the Mass uh, Government um, has put together a wonderful job description or a set of job descriptions that could be really instructive examples for those looking to create JD's job descriptions for others, including, I think, looking at uh, opportunities to interface with community health worker and promote their opportunities. Uh, Claire, I want to give, you, give this uh, last kind of 30 seconds to you before we then close out. And I know that you're working a lot with the National Governors Association and a lot of support with everybody on this line and others to move uh, states forward in this way. Can you share uh, kind of closing thoughts about um, opportunities, pressing opportunities that you see, especially at the governor's level? Yeah, I um, think to move on this. Yeah, thanks, Rishi. And thank you to everyone on the panel. Denise, so well said. Shreya, Alex, incredible ideas. And, and, and Raj and Emily and everybody. Uh, governors are desperate, right, right now, and, and, you know, it sounds crass, but to take advantage of that desperation a little bit and, and start to build community health rapport on top of everything else that's happening in their state, but they need the capacity, they need the space, they need the time to actually build thoughtful programs, to design those with best practices in mind, whether it's the, you know, programmatic standards, is it the sort of optional certification, and then to build the financing strategies on top of that. It is not we want to make it easier, but it's not simple to braid all these different financing streams. So how do we make sure the state governments have the capacity they need to really build out these and to work with all their nonprofit partners um, and give them the time and attention they deserve? Um, and then finally, it's really about um, all of us as a community, a big tent here. And I think we're, you know, Rishi is a great start of it. It's not, you know, finding small differences between approach or a normative position on everything, but really bringing together uh, all of the great thinking on designing programs, on financing them, on supporting healthcare workers, and then really thinking about, you know, to Alex's point in health leads, it's not only the health, but it's the social and interweaving those. So I would argue for a big tent and for really supporting our governors right now to do the right thing and build strong and sort of sustainable community health worker programs. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Rishi. Well, I'll Thank you, Claire. And, and to, to Raj, to Claire, Emily, Denise, uh, Shreya, Alex, um, am I missing anybody? No. Okay. For and actually, I am missing. So for, to all of you right now, we're at time, if not a little past right now. Uh, this was the beginning of a conversation. Right now, we will give you the recording. We'll uh, send along to everybody who's registered the slides, uh, and we'll also send over as we poll our um, our co-hosts here uh, any, any links to specific kind of uh, sign-on letters, action alerts, or resource guides that they as a group um, kind of identify and we'll package that up as part of the email that we send out as co-hosts to everybody to make sure that everybody's got those plug points. Um, know that uh, however you're organizing, just know that if you're in the, that you're, that this is a big tent as Claire was saying right now, um, if there's anything that we can do, um, anybody else uh, on behalf of our, the co-hosts here, if there's anything that we can do as individuals or as a collective uh, that you have in mind, please let us know. Uh, this is the beginning of a conversation about how to advance public health and healthcare priorities and more importantly kind of center it in a community-based workforce that we know we desperately need now and for the future. Uh, I love you all. I don't know many of you, but I do. And I thank you for your patience and I thank you, um, frankly, for the solidarity you're providing to those you serve. Um, to be continued, thank you. And thank you all. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.
And for those who are listening in, you're welcome to listen to this Inside Baseball Sadhana, Mari. Um, before I stop it, I just want to make sure that um, we press the right button. So I'll defer to you in terms of stopping it to make sure that we've got the recording all saved.